Okay, device. Test, test. Test, test. There we go. How about now? I can't even log in. Okay, test. Test, test. Test, test. There we go. Now my levels are good. Okay, thanks everyone on Twitch. Uh, I didn't say anything except for that you have an assignment, and we're going to go over what that's like. So nothing crazy there that you missed. Um, so to do that, we're going to be using the Poem College uh, Dojo Dojos system, the Poem College platform, uh, to run all this. So if you've never done this before, it's very easy. First thing you want to do is register a your username. Uh, very important, your username shows up on the site linked to what you solve. So if you want to be completely anonymous, choose a random username that nobody will know that that's you. There's going to be no way for anyone else to link that to you. If you want to have it be something, if you want to have it to be your Discord name or whatever, totally fine. Feel free to use whatever name you want. Uh, you can use whatever email address you want. The email address doesn't matter. And of course, like remember your password. I think there's a reset functionality now. Is that correct? Yeah. That took a while to uh, actually, you know, to do. Um, okay. So I've already created an account. And when you log in, you'll see the list of dojos here. These are different materials. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. We haven't got there yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the courses here are all the courses that are currently running that are using the Punk College platform. UR 365 Fall 2023. If you want more stuff, a lot of these modules come from these uh, different topics that you're free to explore and do. Uh, these are kind of just a different way of organizing and thinking about these things. Um, and so we are here. You should see, you won't see this stuff at the top, the admin button, because that should hopefully just be me. Um, and so the first one is talking web. So this is going to be what we're going to do. What we're going to learn about today is how uh, to structure HTTP, how the HTTP protocol works and how we can make web requests. The specifics here don't matter. Like I mentioned, we're going to cover that next in starting in 10 minutes. Now we're just going to go over how to use this. So there's uh, important information here of uh, links to different uh, documentations. Uh, those will definitely be there. As we get lectures, lectures will be posted on this page as well as the syllabus, so I'll make sure they're in both places. However, if you want to get started, Connor, uh, when he ran 365, has recordings of his lectures and slides, so feel free, that's not right, uh, feel free to use this material if you like. Um, that's totally up to you, but again, like everything you need to do these will be covered in class. Make sense? Cool. Okay. So there's a bunch of challenges. I know it looks intimidating because there's 39 challenges. Uh, they are quite easy. Uh, let's go over. Yay, curl. We'll start with curl. So first thing you're going to want to do is start the challenge. The difference here is there's two buttons, start and practice, create a special instance just for you to be able to work on this challenge. Uh, when it's done, it will say challenge successfully started. The practice, the difference between the two is practice doesn't have a real flag in it. Practice just gives you a, a fake flag, but gives you root on the container, which may be useful later. I think for these challenges, it's not gonna be useful at all, so ignore it for now. So now that we've started, we can access this stuff in three different ways. Um, one way, I guess I'll go and this is definitely not in the order that I approach them, uh, but one way is with the desktop button. So the desktop button gives you a VNC, like a remote access as if you were on a Linux desktop. So what is this, KDE? Is that what it's running? Yeah, KDE desktop. So you, you can uh, use anything that's on here. Note that there's no internet access here, so you don't get uh, any of that. Hmm? That's XFCE. Oh, yeah. You're making me lie to these kids. Yeah, whatever. It's whatever it is. Uh, there's a terminal, like a terminal here that you can run, get access to the terminal. This is running on the Dojo system. So if you don't have or don't want to set up a local environment to be able to access these things, you can do it all through the browser here. Uh, as we'll go forward, you can explore different things. There's a uh, Ghidra's in here. Wireshark. Did Ida disappear? I guess Ida disappeared. Um, <laughs> 
If you yawn broke it, it's not there. Okay, but for, for any challenge you want to run, you'll want to check out the slash challenge directory. So again, this is where why we had module zero last week of using the command line. If you're not familiar with using things like ls to list a directory or cd to change directory or executing things to the command line, then you definitely should go back and do the module zero uh, bandit over the wire um, because this is going to be uh, uh, important there. So for I think all of these challenges, you just have to execute one thing, challenge run. Um, and what this is doing is actually giving you the output. So the whole idea here is you're making web requests here. And so at the start here, it's going to tell you what you should do. Just make an HTTP request to 127.001, uh, IP address that is local host, on port 80 to get the flag. Uh, you must make this request using the curl command. So this is important. It will tell you what tools. It actually checks that you're using the right tool. Uh, you're basically going to be solving the same levels in three different ways, one using the curl command line tool, one using a raw netcat, which is actually typing in, and I'll, I'll demo that later, of a raw HTTP request to show that you can do these things just by uh, making requests yourself. And then finally with Python. So we use Python a lot in this class. Um, so you'll write Python code in order to solve uh, these levels as well. So this one's pretty uh, simple. It's going to tell us, well, it doesn't tell us what to do. But of course, if we didn't know what this curl thing is, what should we do? Don't press on the help button yet, but maybe. Um, yeah, man curl, so read the curl man page. Go look online, there's tons of stuff on curl. Curl's like one of the, kind of like a Swiss army knife of uh, web security things. It does a ton of stuff. Um, so we want to curl to make an HTTP request. And of course I already know how to do this. So uh, I'm port 80 and it just said make a request, right? So do this. Boom, it gave me the flag. Let's look a little more information verbose. I can see the request that I made, the HTTP request, which again, we're gonna learn about in uh, five minutes. And it responds back with the flag. So we see something like pwn.college blah. If you're on there right now, don't just like randomly type this in. This is a flag just for me that I know it's for me. Um, so go back to the dojo. Uh, ba -ba -ba, talking web. This was level one. <laughs> oh, I hate this. Okay. Let's see. Does it work like that? Or go? Nope. Okay. You have to use the left box thing? Yeah. Uh, okay. Does that actually work? Yay, there we go. Submit the flag. And then boom. It says, well, it would say it was correct, but I have already solved this. That's what that green uh, flag is there here. And then you get credit, and then you can move on. Uh, going forward. So that's way one to access the Pwn College platform. You can also uh, use VS Code through the browser. So this is a whole VS Code instance that's running on the remote system that you can access through the browser. And then from here, you can edit files. I can't remember what files I have here, so I probably shouldn't show you because it's like solutions to stuff, random stuff. but. Uh, uh, anyways, I have a bunch of uh, stuff. Oh, that's good because that's nothing in there. And then there should be a way. I think if you go here, terminal, new terminal, we'll get a terminal within VS Code here. And you can do challenge run and see everything there and see that I have to make the curl request and see that I can get the flag from here. So that's two ways to access the system. The third way is my favorite way. This is the because uh, I hate using this stuff, but it's very useful for a lot of you, so I understand why it's there. Uh, in your, if you go into your settings in the upper right, go to SSH key. This is where you can paste in your public SSH key to get SSH access to the system. Uh, if you don't know how to do this, there's plenty of resources online. I think we have them somewhere. I have it's stuff. On the front page yeah, it's on the front page too of how to access there. Then you can go from the handy dandy. Uh, from your own terminal, and you can do things like uh, SSH, was it hacker at uh, dojo.pwn.college? And then it, oh, and then random definitely password that you couldn't see me type in. Okay, now once I'm logged in, I'll be logged into that instance again. 
I can run that same thing, challenge run. I can see all the same output and I can curl localhost and then get the flag this way. So three different ways to do it, depending on what, what you're most comfortable with. Um, cool thing here, what I like about the SSH is that as you launch a new challenge, it still keeps you in there. So I can click start and then it's removing it, initializing it, connected. And now I'm in web level two. And now it's a different request. It says, uh, I have to make an HTTP request to there. I must make that request with the NC command. So if I did curl local host, uh, it says, eh, that's incorrect. You needed to actually use uh, NC. So NC, uh, actually I'm gonna save this one. We'll go back and do this later when, uh, uh, when we've learned more stuff of how to actually make this command. Okay, uh, and then people are asking very correctly. So on the course page, there's this course link, which they should be able to see, right? Mm -hmm. So we've moved the syllabus here. The old syllabus redirects here, so you don't have to worry about which one's which. So you can see the syllabus here. This is where we'll still po post, like we said, the recorded lectures, the lecture slides, including today's, as well as uh, the, um, the modules as they're released. And then you can, uh, so two things you need to do, two steps in order to link things to, together. Uh, so first thing, Go here to identif identity, I kept wanting to say identify. Uh, identity on the course page for this course, put in your ASU student ID. We've uploaded all of your student IDs from the roster there. So you should be able to put that in there and that's how we know that, that you are you and that's how we're able to link that random person with that random uh, email address there. You can at any point check your grade. So your grade saying, why do I have an E right now? So I haven't done all this stuff right yet, right? We have an assignment due, it's out. As I solve things, this progress will go up. Also, I guess I'm the professor, I don't have to solve these things, so that's more of a you problem than a me problem. Um, where do you find the text field? The which one? Uh, the text field for uh, uh, Identity on the course page. So it'd be like right here. Yeah, this, uh, the course page, uh, which you can go to. It'll be on dojos on the course and then course course. Yeah, there'll be a link here to course and then this has all the information. Uh, if you go to the current syllabus, it will take you there and you'll have the identity button there. So that's uh, one thing. One aspect to be able to us to know that you're an ASU student and this is your grade, great. The other important thing is in settings. So we now have our own beautiful, what are these called? sections, modules of uh, Category. categories of uh, Discord. So this is where all the announcements and everything will be, will be announced here. Um, but only people with this role, uh, which one is it? It is this one, uh, ASU CSE 365 Fall 2023. To do that, you link yourself, up, go to your settings and Discord on the left here, I'm already linked. So link your account with your Discord username, and then boom, now you will have access to all of that stuff. Yeah. This is about something we discussed earlier. Sure. How do you link your SSH account? Yeah, so uh, in settings here, under SSH key, I have my public key is in here already. So you can do that. Uh, let's see, I guess, cat. So this is my one of my SSH keys, I guess. Oh yeah, that's right, I got you to do the other one. Uh, so this is one of my SSH keys. So I just copy and paste the public key in there and then it knows that it's me so I can SSH in and it knows who I am. If it's empty, it's for you to put in. You need to make an SSH key yeah, and put it in there. What if someone uses your ASU ID? Uh, don't do that, I don't know. Why would you know somebody's ASU user ID? or ASU ID, that's your 10 digit student number. It shouldn't be something that, like at the end of the day, I know who you all are. I have like registers and stuff. So if I needed to go digging, I guess I can. That's somebody from Twitch. Cool, look at that, ah, two minutes late. 
think it's because of the audio problem. Otherwise, we're out of time. All right. Oh. And did I talk about when this is due? Due in a week. So it's 40-ish levels, but they should go very quickly. Like, they're not supposed to be very difficult. Um, but get started early so you're not trying to cram it all in at the end. I guess I'll say this all the time, but uh, there's nothing I can say to actually make you do that. Uh, I guess we'll see how it goes the first time. Um, cool. All right. And let's do some learning. Okay. So we are... That's crazy. How come OBS knows to get that one and not this one? Who knows? All right. Oh, uh, good question on Twitch. So if you've already done those challenges because you've either, let's say you took 365 last semester over the summer and you withdrew from the class, so you're taking it again, like you don't have to solve the same thing over again. So those solves just continue to count. It's not like you have to do the same work over and over again. Uh, so if you're confused about that, I guess let us know. Yeah. Um, so I it's periodically rolling. Oh, it periodically runs. So it will, yeah, it's a polling system. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can talk about the Ah, great, great question. Thank you for reminding me. You want to do stuff in recitations? Okay. Course to the beautiful syllabus. Okay, yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, so recitations will be like labs. So just like, Come work on challenges. We'll have anywhere from two to four TAs there to help you. Um, and so show up recitations. If we need more locations, we'll add them. But for now, Brickyard 210, you do not have to go to your specific recitation. You can go to any recitations. Uh, don't go to whatever room number is there. Go to this room number, Brickyard 210. Um, and that will start today. So we'll have three people, I think, today at 430 to help you out with the challenges. No, optional. Uh, optional, and you may attend any recitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I added that today because I was getting questions. So thank you for reminding me to announce that. Cool. The idea is to help you, not force you to come to this thing. But you know, come if you want to use this as the time you work on the challenges. That's fine too. Come, show up, open your laptop, work on stuff. If you're stuck, ask questions. Cool. All right. All right. The web. So, I mean, we're going to get into the specifics of what we mean here, um, but the web, the birth of the web, and we'll actually get into what we talk, what we mean with the, the web, uh, and we're uh, going to go in a little bit of a strange order. We're going to go from like the highest level of networking here, so we're going to learn about uh, the web and a protocol that runs on networks. As we go down, we'll eventually go down and learn how the low level packets make their way to things and do TCP, UDP, all that fun stuff. We're going to start at a high level um, first to give you this background so that we can use that in uh, future modules. So the web actually started, this is, um, anybody know what operating system this is? DOS? No, good, good try. Mac OS, almost correct, very close. Yeah. What was it? Close. It wasn't an Apple Next. Somebody said it. Yeah, it's Next. So Next was, uh, you can actually see the logo in the upper right there. So Next was, uh, I don't know if you know the story, but Steve Jobs was ousted from Apple uh, by, was it the Pepsi guy, I think, that like came in and like kicked him out of Apple. Um, and so he, he then created a competing company called Next that eventually Apple bought, and then he retook over Apple from within Next. Uh, does anybody do any iOS development? Some people? Yeah, what's, uh, don't, uh, what's, so when you're doing iOS development, what's like, uh, you know there's uh, variables that have, or class names that are prefaced with NS underscore, like capital NS, like, no? Or is that Objective-C or something? All right, I'm losing my analogy, but uh, if somebody looks it up, there's like NS underscore, I think it's the dictionaries and NS something. There's all these frameworks that start with NS, and that's because they come all the way from next step. 
uh, which was the name of the company. Um, uh, okay, and so this was actually the a screenshot of the very first web browser. Um, so it was created on this next system in, I think it's 91, uh, which we'll look at in a minute. And, uh, and this was the very first web page. Um, it actually still exists. You can go check it out now. It's a historical artifact. Um, and the web was essentially created by um, one guy, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, or now Sir, if you invent something as important as the internet, I guess you get knighted if you're British, which is pretty cool. Um, and he was working at CERN. What does CERN do? Anybody know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's a great. Do you work for them? That sounds like a marketing pitch. No, I'm just trying to get magnetic Cool. So yeah, they like shoot, uh, mod like shoot particles at each other to hit like at very high speed, so they break apart, so that they can kind of see what's in them and do all this. I don't know, crazy physics stuff. Um, and <clears throat> when he got there, so CERN is like a big. I think it's like a government-funded organization, but it has a lot of visiting scientists. So scientists. Physicists, other kinds of people would come into CERN and out of CERN. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee was there. And he had this idea, and, and there were these concepts, as we'll see around, that were kind of floating around of uh, how to identify things, how to have hypertext uh, links on a page. But, uh, um, but he said, hey, it's really annoying to figure out where everyone is, like what even their offices are, like who is here? Like if you can remember, does anybody remember a phone book? Has anyone seen a physical phone book? Yeah, like if the yellow pages, what they used to call it, like the list of all um, uh, businesses in an area with phone numbers so that you could reach out to them because there was no other way of finding that information uh, or no easy way. So he thought, hey, it'd be really great if we had some system so that people could actually see where each, where each other was. So he had this first proposal to CERN to create the uh, web, or sorry, to create like kind of like an internal um, system, but he did it in such a way that it could be extended in the end. And this, that first website that we saw was in like the end of 1990. And there's a fantastic book if you're interested in this. It's called, it's a book from him called Weaving the Web. Um, and man, I guess I don't have that, uh, those stats, but uh, this was in basically 1990 was the literal invention of the web at CERN. And by like 94, 95 is when you started having crazy like dot-com bubbles and different browsers and stuff. And it kind of, everything really exploded from there. Um, then you had the original dot-com bubble in 2000. Um, anyways, all kinds of crazy stuff. So. The design was basically like thinking about how to share research results and information at CERN. And like I said, it combined multiple emerging technologies. Uh, so one is hypertext. So besides being like a super cool term, what does like hypertext mean? Yeah. Text that are linked. Yeah, that are linked. But what does that mean to be linked? Somebody? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, more generally, right? It's a text, some kind of text document, text document that has a way to tell you, hey, if you want more information, go see this other document, right? And that's what you're kind of used to is clicking on links. You go to one page, you see something, you click a link, and then all of a sudden you're on an insane Wikipedia page that you uh, never thought you'd see. So. But this, this wasn't an idea that he necessarily invented. This idea of hypertext has been around a, uh, for a while. Um, also, the internet was, and we'll actually get into the history of the internet. The internet has a much earlier date, so it really bugs me when people use web interchangeably for internet. Uh, the web is just one protocol that runs on the internet. Email is another protocol that predates the web. Uh, but honestly, so much of what we do now on the internet is the web. So that I guess I can't fault it too much. And so from these like humble beginnings of CERN, the problems that they're trying to solve is 
how do we get universal access to a large universe of documents, right? How can you have a system where I can say, okay, I have this document and then there's links, there's indications on that page of how to get more documents. And so there's actually like incredibly simple design here of answering these questions. How do I name a resource? So how do I know what to call something? Um, so, how, so when I say a document, what, where is that document? How do I ask for it? How does the person or the thing that I'm asking for it know what I'm asking for? Then let's say I know what document I'm interested in. Then how do I request that? How do I get that document and say, hey, I would like this document. And then how do they respond back to me to say, aha, here is your document. And finally, the third problem is how to actually create this hypertext, how to create a document that has these links. So there's three major technologies here that were actually created that underpin the entire web. So if you can understand these three technologies, then you understand the web. Uh, the first one is how to name things. This is uh, the uniform resource identifier, so URI. The, there's this uh, uh, issue with URI URL where it first was universal or uniform resource locator was with the L. Uh, have you heard, I'm sure, have you heard of the URL before? Yeah. So that's like specific to HTTP basically. And then they realized that could be more general. And so that's when they created this URI concept. Um, so now you can name a thing. So that tells you this name, as we'll see, tells you who has that information and how do I ask that for that information. Um, then HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. That is the layer where a lot of, so a lot of what you'll be doing in this module is understanding how to make an HTTP request to a server and then also how to interpret the server's response. Um, Cool, and then the hypertext comes back. So once you get data back from the server, uh, how does that data tell you where to get more data, right? This hypertext notion, how do links work? Uh, that's in HTML. So specifically for this module, we're only gonna cover um, the first two concepts. We'll return later to HTML and learn about that when we talk about web security and uh, those types of vulnerabilities. So there's actually a really simple, so there's like three things at play here. They're really kind of simple. You first need a URI and that's your starting point. This tells you how to make a request. And specifically, as we'll see, this tells you what server am I making this request to? So you make the request. And then once you know the server you want to talk to, you make an HTTP request to that server. That server will then return you HTML. Then that HTML will contain more links that have URIs that when you click on them, this whole cycle repeats. Questions? Yeah. Did domains exist before the web? Say it again. Domains, did they exist before the web? Did domains exist before the web? Whew. Great question. I think the answer is yes, but I'd have to look at the specs for DNS to see for certain. I think DNS was something that came about pretty quickly because people realized they didn't want to type in like IP addresses. IP addresses. Yeah. And they realized, hey, it'd be really terrible to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great questions. Uh, so one, so this is why a lot of browsers have like a home page. When you first boot a browser up, it needs to go somewhere, right? If you're Google and you make a browser like Chrome, you probably have that set to, to google.com. Uh, otherwise, you can change that nowadays with stateful browsers where it keeps track of the thousands of tabs if you're like me that you have open all the time. Even when you shut it down, it comes back up with all those tabs right there. Uh, but yeah, you need to know some initial place to go. This is why um, Yahoo was super famous. Does anybody, has anybody been to Yahoo? Yeah. Anybody know what the original Yahoo was? What was it? Uh, partly, even before that, maybe it was like a mostly a static web page. 
Yeah, so Yahoo was originally just like the yellow pages. It just had categories and then links to other pages. So you would set Yahoo as your homepage because you could find other stuff from there. This is because search engines at the time were freaking terrible and you could never find what you were looking for. It'd take like three or four pages of clicking through in order to actually get to your information. Okay, so that's the first question, how to start this cycle, which is a great question if you ever see a cycle like this, right? Because something has to start it. Uh, and then I forgot the second part of your question, so you wanna ask it again? Ah, uh, yes, they all came about at the same time. So this was like a, a set of problems that had to be solved, and to do so, uh, Tim Berners-Lee created protocols for each of these. So there's specifications for URIs, HTTP and HTML. You can even see the link between um, HTML and HTTP, because the H in HTTP is what? Hypertext, Hypertext Transform Protocol, and HTML is the Hypertext Markup Language, so there's already that linking there. Even though, as we'll see, there's nothing that says that an HTTP request or response has to contain HTML. Yeah? Were there other protocols like Yeah, good question. Were there other protocols? I don't know the, all the history of everything, but there was for sure like hypertext systems, like HyperCard, I think was an, I want to say a Mac app that you could, um, that you could use to do hypertext documents, but I think if I remember correctly, that was only on like one machine. Like it wasn't a distributed system or it wasn't distributed in the sense that how to ask different machines for information. I guess Gopher was something that I don't know too much about, but you can look that up. It's actually used in the CTFs uh, because it's a weird protocol that you can control some things about the request. But uh, yeah, uh, Gopher I think was one of these early kinds of things. Um, but I, in my mind, one of the, the reasons why this took off was because A, there was well-defined protocols for all three of these things so that anyone could build any of these parts. And this is why you don't use the original, uh, what was it called, WWW, World Wide Web, uh, Tim Berners-Lee original Next app browser. Nobody uses that nowadays. Um, I think M Mosaic, was one of the first big graphical web browsers. Uh, but anyone could implement anything that like talked to these languages. So web servers, web browsers, all these things. Uh, cool, yeah, great questions. Anything else? All right, so the first aspect is URI. So again, that's, that was a good question. This is what kicks off this whole process. So we need to understand how to ask for things. And specifically, we want to know what protocol to use. That's what the universal, or I guess it's not universal, but uniform part is. What, the, what protocol, how to ask for the thing, and where to get it from. So basically, it answers the following questions. Which server has this information? How do I ask for that information? Then how can the server, a server may have thousands of documents, how does it know which one I'm asking for? And one of the beauties of why I like uh, networking and I like studying these things is again, you don't have to reverse engineer a web browser in order, or a web server in order to understand how URIs should be parsed or should be understood. Um, there is a definition in an RFC. You can look at RFC 3986 and this will bring up everything you could possibly want to know about URIs. Like, if, like, if you have any questions about how something is parsed or how something should be parsed, then you can go up and those, look in those specifications. Cool. So the syntax is actually pretty simple. Uh, and this is, again, it, it may seem, I don't know, silly. Have you ever, I mean, I assume a lot of you have seen, like, URIs before, URLs, copied them before, pasted them, sent them to somebody? Please nod your head so I know that person using computers for your life. Yeah, you probably clicked on a link that I sent you to the syllabus, right? Cool. So then it's like actually then understanding what these bits are is what that is. And honestly, that's what I think a lot of computer science is, is digging in and saying, okay, I've used this thing before, but how does it actually work under the hood? Um, okay, cool. So the, that's weird. Okay, got it. Okay, so the parts of a URI that are important 
are the scheme. So this, as we'll see, correlates to protocol. That's that HTTP part at the front. Uh, the authority, the authority is who has that information. The path, so the path here is, uh, we'll talk about that, but that's the path. And then a question mark, a query part, and then a hash, and then a fragment. So breaking this down, the scheme is very easy. It's the protocol used to request the resource. This is why you see links, they say HTTPS colon slash slash. You will then see that those are, um, we'll use HTTPS when you click them versus HTTP. You can, this is why um, you can send, I think I even have this maybe on the syllabus. I can't remember if I did this for this year, maybe not. But uh, if you ever click a link that like automatically opens your email client with like an email already filled out to an address and a subject, anybody do that before? Yeah, that's through a URI. So that's the scheme there is mailed to, and it's just like a special thing. Then you can even specify telephone numbers. The idea was to be super general without anything you wanted to be able to locate, uh, you could uh, identify it here. The authority is the server, and this is the entity that decides how to interpret all the rest. And this is like an important kind of a subtle point here is that the rest of this, the path query fragment, you may think that it has semantic meaning to you, but fundamentally it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is to the server. So that server knows how to respond. It could treat the path as the query, or it actually can't do anything about the fragment, which we'll talk about later, but it could interpret that however it wants. Um, but the idea is if you ask for a resource, it should give you back roughly the same thing. And it's usually just a server name. So uh, this can be broken down uh, so usually the server name is the host. You can do DNS names. You can do uh, IP addresses. And you can even, I think it's an older format. You used to be able to put in username passwords here that would auto off. Uh, I think that's been taken away. But uh, you can actually try to like be a specific username at host colon port uh, inside there. So that's when we did, uh, I think one of these examples, we did curl HTTP colon slash slash uh, one two seven zero zero one colon eighty, and that was specifying port eighty. Every protocol has a default port, so the port of HTTP is eighty. So you do not need to specify that normally. The path is usually some hierarchical representation of paths, just like you would be familiar with on um, a Unix system. You have slash, and then you have several subdirectories there. But again, what this path actually means doesn't matter. A query used to pass used to pass additional key value data, as we'll see. Uh, and then the fragment is actually something that's kind of interesting if you've ever seen the thing after the hash. This is actually never sent to the server. Um, and this is because this is used by your browser in order to identify which part of this document you want to go to. Cool, so let's look at some examples. So. I have an example like here. What's the scheme? Foo. What's the authority? Sample.com. And of that authority, so that's the host of the authority. What's the port? 8042. Excellent. And the path? Over there. And the query? Test equals bar and the fragment? Nose. Cool. Okay, you can have simple ones like this. So this is like an example of an FTP. So the FTP protocol as, as the scheme, the authority, the path. So again, like you can see here, query can be optional. Fragment can be optional. You don't necessarily need those. Uh, oh, yeah, there's the mail to example. Now, how do we parse something like this? What's the, what's the scheme? <laughs> HTTPS, what's the authority? What was that? Nobody wants to raise their hand, why? Maybe if I wait long enough, the people on Twitch will type something. Yeah. Example.com, why? Uh, 
But why is it not uh, example.com slash test slash example, and then one is the port? But how do you know? The, the authority comes before the path. And the authority syntax was host colon port. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Yeah, good question. The scheme can change, but HTTP and HTTPS are pretty standard. They don't change things. Yeah. Say it again. And what about what's? Let's try something else. What's the query? Slash Adam, why is that the query and not a continuation of the path? Because the path is continues slashes. Yeah. The question mark? Yeah, so the key question, the key problem is uh, we actually can't tell based on this. There's This is like two mess, this actually may not parse correctly or it may parse in a different way. So for instance, what if I wanted the question mark to be part of the path? Yeah, so similarly, great. So why are you thinking backslash? Because that, wait, did I did it? It's one of those slashes. Um, yeah, but where'd you come up with backslash? Did you just make that up in your head? Or? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but you put a slash before a slash of characters, so put it, create it. Like with strings in your programming languages, right? You have this constant string uh, encased by double quotes. You want to put a double quote inside that string? You put a backslash before it, backslash double quotes. Uh, some other things like backslash n for new lines. So you have this problem where you have some syntax, right? We have these URIs that there are things here that have special meanings, right? And a colon here has a special meaning. Slash has a special meaning. The question mark, like we talk about, has a special meaning. The hash has a special meaning. If you had a hash in there, the server wouldn't send anything after that to the server. So uh, it's not slash encoding, but basically we need to encode. There's it, the standard defines all of these characters that if you want to use them, you have to encode them correctly. Uh, so there's actually a lot of them. Uh, colon slash. I guess I shouldn't just. I guess you can look at these. There's a single quote, and they use something called percent encoding. So it's different than slash, so it's not slashes. Uh, you've probably seen this in URLs with like percents, like a bunch of percent signs. Um, and it's actually used, this is what the spec says, but the spec is uh, what should happen and the servers actually implement what does happen. Um, so basically anything that's not alphanumeric, a digit, a dash, a dot, an underscore, or a tilde should be percent encoded. And the way that is, is you do a, a percent sign and then followed by the hexadecimal representation of the byte. So how do we figure out the hexadecimal representation of a byte? Yeah, look up the ASCII table, right? And we actually have our handy dandy man page. Oh, I guess I should. So we can check in here. And if we wanted to encode uh, the question mark that we were looking at, uh, here it is. So question mark is 7F, so in hex. So if we wanted to represent that, we'd replace that in the string as percent two seven. And then that way the web server knows to interpret that as part of the path or part of wherever it is, yeah. Ah, 3F is question mark, then what's this, delete? Thank you, Three. yeah, that makes more sense. Yes, 3F is question mark. 2F is slash. Cool. So so ampersand, if we want to use an ampersand, because uh, by convention, most query parameters are key equals, like name equals value separated by ampersand. Uh, and, but if we want to use that as a key or a value, we'd want to encode that. So this would be translated into percent two six. Now, what if you want to encode a percent or use a percent sign? Yeah. 
Yeah, so just like the problem of once you have an escape character, like in your strings, once you can have slash double quote, if you want to include a, a slash, then you need two of them, and then it becomes, you know, uh, to do that. Uh, so yeah, so that would be percent 25. Space is percent 20. This is like a very standard one. And so on. So let's fix this. So now if I gave you something like this, can you parse this? So now what's the, the scheme remains HTTPS. What's the authority? Example.com. And what's the path? Test slash example. This is a colon, colon one dot HTML. And then the, the query. Yeah, slash Adam. So it's everything after the end, the percent 25, uh, two F, sorry, percent two F Adam. Um, you tested it on Google and it worked. Yeah, good. So I'm not teaching you just random gibberish, right? Cool. So this is very important. So if you, to pass data to the web application, uh, this is incredibly important. Um, what are we doing on time? Uh, really, uh, time flies. Okay, cool. We'll go faster. So with URIs, uh, I guess we won't get into this precisely necessarily for this, but it's important to know. Uh, when we have a URI, we can specify an absolute location. So this tells you exactly, use this protocol, use this authority. This is the resource I'm talking about. Or it could be relative to the current resource. So depending on what page you are, this link may be different. So this says relative to the current scheme. So this is how you can give a URI that uh, uses the same scheme. So HTTP or HTTPS, it will work. Um, slash test slash help.html is relative to the current authority. So on whatever server you're on. Dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. This means relative to the current authority and path. Um, and context is always important. So it depends on where you are and where those all resolve. Okay, cool. So getting into HTTP. So HTTP is, again, that protocol. Now we have the URI. We know exactly now how URIs work how we get that, how to request a resource from a server. Um, it's based on TCP, as we'll talk about later. It uses port 80 by default. Version 1.0 was defined in May of 96. And there was a very important thing that happened in 99 where they had to upgrade it. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. And yeah, version two is actually not still under discussion. It's done. So the way this works, the server first listens for incoming TCP connections. The client then makes a TCP connection to the server, sends the request, where the server then reads that request and figures out what the client is asking for and then sends a response. So it looks something like this. So you have your browser that's also called a uh, user agent. It doesn't actually have to be a graphical web browser. You can do all kinds of cool stuff uh, with this. Uh, and actually, a lot of times, your web application or your site, uh, your mobile device, all the apps on your phone will use, um, uh, will make some web requests. And you have a server, you make a request, and you get a response. But in reality, there's actually a lot of junk going on. There's caches and proxies in between you and the server. Uh, you make that request all the way to the server, and it has to go back through all of these. But the important parts that you need to know, our HTTP request consists of a method so this is the classic uh, get and post as we'll talk about, but functionally it can actually be anything as long as the server supports it. The resource that you're trying to access, which is derived from the URI, the protocol version that you're talking, the client information, the body of the request, so you can send things in the body. Um, and the syntax is actually very simple. This is why like, you will be typing these in manually, like by hand, because it's uh, fun to do this stuff or fun for me, and I guess, it's, I don't really, I'm sure you'll have fun, trust me. Um, so first you have the start line, followed by headers, followed by body, that's at a very high level how the protocol works. Each line is separated by CRLF. Um, you can actually, you don't, web servers are very forgiving, so you don't have to be protocol precise in your request. You can just, as long as this web server understands what you're talking about, it will give you the flag. Um, Headers are separated from the body via an empty line, just a CRLF. So we'll get to an example in a second. Uh, methods. So the method is the 
what essentially what the client is trying to ask the server to do to that resource. So some common methods are a get. So we want to, hey, just give me whatever resource is here. And this is in all caps, get. Post is traditionally associated with, hey, uh, process, like I'm gonna give you data as part of my HTTP request, as part of the body, and I want you to interpret that. Put is mostly used in like REST APIs and stuff. It's not really used by web browsers. Um, and head is equivalent to a get, except that the server doesn't return a body. So you're actually just trying to look at what headers and things that the server returns to you. Uh, there's also other things that you can look up and check out here, but uh, we don't really go into these. Um, cool, so a request looks like this. So this is the start line. So start line is three things separated by space. First, the method. So this is a get request to the resource slash. That's the, um, what do we call that? Yeah, uh, the resource, yeah, there we go, sorry. And then the version, so this is HTTP slash one one. Then after a CRLF, it's all of the headers. Headers are of the form header name, colon, space, and then the value. So this is specifying the user agent, telling the server what software is making the request. The host parameter is really important because it uh, allows a single web server to listen on the same IP address for multiple and serve multiple websites. So the server knows what, uh, what request the user is trying to make and accept, and you can't see it. So what can't you see in this that is there in this request? So format is the start line, which we have at the top, headers. So headers, there's three headers here. And then what? And then the header is separated by the body via an empty line. So there's an empty line, and that is always there. Even if the body is empty, there's still stuff there. Cool. Okay, modern requests may be quite different. So this is like just a snapshot of some of the things. But again, this is just additional stuff that's being sent along to help the servers and the clients kind of figure things out. The response, the server will respond with the protocol version, the status code. So this is, if you've seen, have you seen a 404 before? Yeah, that's an HTTP response code that's defined in the specification that says this resource does not exist. Um, so the code, a short reason, headers, a body, <sighs> And the syntax is very much the same, a status line followed by headers, again, CRLFs, all those headers, and then a, an empty new line that then specifies the body. Cool. So the status codes can be, let's look at this and then we'll go back to that thing. So generally these are the categories of status codes. A 100, 200s are usually good. So a 200 is the most common one that says, yes, you did everything correctly. <coughs> 300 is a redirect that says go somewhere else. Why would you want to tell somebody to go somewhere else for a resource? Because it changed, the location changed, but you don't want that link to break because there may be links to that old place. And so you want to, rather than just say, I don't know what you're talking about, you can say, aha, I know where that thing is. It's over here, go get it. 400 uh, means the client messed up. So if you see a 400 when you're typing in the request manually, that means that you messed up. A 500 is when the server messes up, where the server causes some exception. And these are some examples. Cool. Oh, more examples. I guess we don't need all these. Okay. Let's go and check it out. All right. So this says I need to make a request on with Netcat. So Netcat is, uh, I can check out the man page. You can also check out the man page of man if you're very confused. Uh, NC destination port. So I need to make a request to local host. Uh, local host is just an alias to 127.001. Port 80. So what type of request did I want? Did it want me to make? I guess this is just an HTTP request. But let's do a get request to slash. Man, I forget. Oh, I was hoping I could do this off my dome. Okay. Done. Why did that work? 
Yeah, I did the status, the, the start line, and then no headers. So that was the empty line when I hit enter. And then it responded HTTP 1.1, 200, OK. So it re responded with its version, a 200 response, OK, and gave me the flag. Yeah. So Netcat will, is making a connection. So the server is listening on some port, and Netcat is making a connection there. You can actually set Netcat to listen, but that's something you don't need for here. Um, so yeah, and the, the server, oh no, it did connection close, so it should be done, yeah. Uh, but you can ask it to keep alive a connection and then make multiple requests through there. You can also, if you want to get like, I guess, really fancy, uh, see if that works, nope. I thought that would work. Oh, because I did, it has to be capitalized. So you learn something new every day. Anyways, you can do it however you want. You, as long as it goes through Netcat, you can write a file type into there. You can do echo. I like typing it in because it's fun. It's like you're in the danger zone of making requests. Um, cool. OK, yeah, so this was another type of request that we saw. And this is like a real. Um, some things to look out for, for sure, are, uh, I guess I don't have examples in here, but we should post some examples of the uh, content length. So when you're uploading a request as a client, the server needs to know how much data you're going to send. And so there's a header called content length to say how much data you're going to be sending. Um, but this is like a real world example of the return code here all these crazy headers uh, that get set, and then finally the HTML content of the page. Um, cool, okay. Uh, one crazy thing, we'll just do this really quick. I guess this is, uh, I think this is all you need. Um, so HTTP is a stateless protocol, meaning it's like, oh wait, we go till 2.45. Oh, I've been rushing, I thought we were done. Okay, great, we have so much time to run. Awesome, okay, so, uh, Ah, it's like getting, finding free time. Okay, so essentially, so HTTP is a stateless protocol, and what this means is that it's kind of like, anybody seen the movie Memento? It's like with a guy with short-term, or I guess long-term memory loss, so everything, it's like, uh, you're just showing up, and he's like, hey, how's it going? Like, I've never seen you before, even though you just met five minutes ago. So somebody with like no long-term memory processing, similar with these web servers. You go to a web server and you ask for something, it's like, hey, I've never seen you before. Here is what you want. Um, and that's actually baked into the protocol. There's no notion of, hey, I, but how, how do you know I'm not the person that made this request yesterday? And so that actually makes it very difficult to do things like, how do I make a web application like Pwn College that knows when I log in? Because there's no way of doing that. Um, so we want, would like to maintain state, and specifically, we want to know if I make a request A five minutes ago, and then I make a follow-up request B right now, how does the server know that A and B are linked? So one way I could do that is use the IP address. Is that a good idea? No. no. Why not? You can always use like a VPN or something. Right now, you can use, yeah, so right now, most of us will probably be out through the same IP address. I don't know how many external IPs uh, uh, ASU has, uh, if you were in your house, everyone in your house would then be logged into the same website. So that could be bad for you, depending on what websites you, your house visits. Um, and so the goal is we want to create this notion of a session that links all the requests back to the individual browser or ideally the user that made them. Uh, and this allows things like authentication. We want to know, we want to be able to have, give different access to the system to different users. Um, and to make actually think. So there's several ways to do this. I'm only gonna talk about one of them because it's the only one that's actually used. Um, sometimes they embed information in URLs about who you are. This is if you've ever, uh, some, sometimes you can do this where like your user information is embedded in a URL. The danger there is if you send that to somebody else, then they could log in as you, which is very bad. Uh, okay, but the main way is cookies. So. Cookies were created as a way to solve this problem. Anybody ever hear about cookies in the context of the web? Yeah, so what are they? A lot more people for the first one, yeah. yeah. It's like a way to like, 
it's like small bits of information that are stored in the cloud browser, mm -hmm. whether or not we session storage or local storage. Yeah, so it's basically, it's just, it's literally to solve this problem, right? It's just some information that the server says, hey, browser, you store this for me. And then when you make a request, send it back, and that way I can know who you are. Um, so the server is the one that initiates this process and asks the server to store a cookie. Then the server or user agent at any time could terminate the session. So the, ser the client can decide to just uh, throw away that cookie and not use it when it makes a request, in which case the server will not know that this user is the same user. Uh, cookie, cookies were first created by Netscape uh, way back when they were trying to make an e-commerce application and they realized this problem of like, oh, wait, how do we make an actual application where people can buy things? Um, in 97, is this was the first attempt to standardize cookies. And actually, this is like fascinating if you look at this history. Cookies are seem to be so simple, but they're insanely uh, complicated. So. This RFC from April of 2011 describes how cookies are actually used in the web because there's a lot of different options you can specify on cookies. We won't need to go into that level of detail, but... Um, so cookies are name value pairs separated by an equal sign. And the server includes the set cookie header in an HTTP response. So the server will, as part of its response, say, hey, set this cookie user equals foo. That way, when the user agent makes follow-up requests to that server, it specifies a cookie header on the request, and now the server can link those things. So when making a request, the server would make this request cookie equals user uh, foo. The server can ask for multiple cookies to be set. It can set multiple things. If you actually check your cookies, you'll see a lot of this weird stuff in there of your language preferences are uh, done this way, all kinds of stuff. Um, there's several attributes, uh, path, so you can specify what path of the server the cookie is valid for. The domain, so if subdomains are valid for that cookie, do you want any subdomain of google.com, like docs.google.com to have the same cookie? An expiration date, uh, when the server, when the client should uh, reject the cookie. Uh, we'll ignore those for now. So this is from a request I made a long time ago, so don't worry, these cookies aren't going to work. Um, so this is from making a request to google.com. So Google is asking to set a, and this is super interesting, that um, the cookie, like I said, the equal sign is just like a, I think it must be very simple because it does after there. So it does... Uh, so the name of this would be pref and the value would be ID colon or ID this thing colon F equals this thing. Blah, blah, blah. It's probably some custom Google thing to specify all those. Sets an expiration date, a path, a domain, um, and with an NID also as well here. I don't know what this 67, that's kind of weird, but uh, I don't know, whatever. It's just an opaque block that the server wants the, the user to send. Um, so it was set two years in the future. Uh, the server can delete cookies, tell the browser that the, that it's deleted uh, by setting an expires date in the past. So you can set an old expiration date and on setting a cookie and it will delete it. Uh, okay. The client, the user agent is, really, is responsible for following the server's policies. But again, this is why you ever clear your cookies before. Yeah, so this is what you're doing. This is all your browser is doing is going through and deleting all of those. Now when you visit those websites, it's like you're visiting it fresh, yeah. Can cookies, like, depend on each other? Can cookies depend on each other? Interesting, in what context? Like for example, if you have like a, an access policy and like Yeah, it's interesting. I the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I don't usually they're not. Usually it's it's defined to like. So a terrible way to do it would be to put your user ID or something in the cookie, but the cookies are stored on the user's browsers and they can edit and change them at will. You'll see that as you make requests, as sending cookie values back. 
you can put literally whatever value you want there. So if you can put, if you can easily guess other people's user IDs and change your cookie value to be another user, that would be really bad. So usually it's some random value that then links onto a database or something, or they cryptographically sign something and give it to you so that they can tell if it's been tampered with. Um, yeah, these are the main ways that it's done. And that way they can identify you. And then on the web application, then they can say, oh, this person has access to this. They're a teacher, not a student, or sorry. sorry. They're a student, not a teacher, so they have access to different things. Yeah. There's a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, so you said the first book case for your that was like Netscape, right? For like mm -hmm. systems. So it would use cookies to like authenticate different users. Mm -hmm. And so was it pop was it kind of a threat back then to like spoof certain information? Oh yeah, it's still a threat now. Like some I mean, I guess now there's so many web apps that, ha or sorry, web app frameworks that handle cookies for you that you, most web developers don't need to write their own custom cookie handling mechanisms, but you can always mess it up. Like, uh, so yeah, it depends on the web app, but yeah, there was a lot of problems earlier in the day, like in the early web history of people just didn't really think through the fact that like, oh, I'm giving a cookie to you. Assuming that your browser will always give it back to me the same way, well, of course, nothing prevents you from editing that or making a request to me. Um, and that's really about what you're learning now is these requests, you can make literally any request to any web server using just your terminal with Netcat. Um, cool. All right, so now that we're there, let's do, I wanna do two things. Let's look up the HTTP specification. So I did not talk about a few things. Okay. I think there's a link here on the thing, but we'll just go with this. Cool. Okay. So you can always read this. I know that may sound silly, but there's actually kind of interesting stuff about how all this stuff works. If you're interested in like, for instance, uh, transfer encoding, there's all kinds of crazy stuff about how to transfer different information from one side to the other. What I'm interested in now, because you're going to be making a request. So the request we talked about, the method, the SP means space here, method, request URI, HTTP version. Um, these are the different methods. This is like when I brought up all those things, like I didn't just make up those different HTTP options, right? They come all from the specification that you can check out. Uh, if you want to know what a request URI looks like, it can be something like this. Um, Anyways, the important thing though is, yeah. So these are kind of uh, important characters. Anyways, this is what I was mentioning earlier. If you're uploading data to a server, the content length is very important because it specifies in the body how much, because there's nothing in the request that says when a server should stop, like how much data are you uploading? Uh, there's only the start line, headers, and then a new line, and then the body. And the body could be unlimited length. So uh, you need that. And then we didn't talk about this, but I think we talked about it a little bit. So we curled localhost. Oh, but I messed that up. Um, so we did this. About one. And then, OK, so going over URIs again, foo and Okay, so name equals value and uh, bar equals value. Okay, cool. So this obviously didn't work, but in this URI, which part is the query? Yeah, so everything after the uh, question mark to the end. And then the web server interprets this and separates by ampersand each of the name value pairs. So the web application on the other side can look and say, okay, is there something named name? So for instance, there are challenges that say, hey, make a, re a get request and set the name equal to value. Um, the other thing is this is something for, I need a curl one because I can't demo here. Let's go. Four. 
There we go. Oh, you know what I was thinking we should do? Is set it so that it keeps the history without quitting. Yeah. There's some bash option to yeah, do yeah. that. I just don't know what it is. We have to talk to you about it. Cool. Okay. Well, I don't know if I want to show you on the curl, but anyways, uh, I actually do have this. So this is making our get request. So the V option just has curl show me what's actually happening. So the arrows indicate the direction. So this is what I'm sending to them. And the other direction is what comes back. Um, now this is passing parameters as part of the get string. We can see that they end up here as part of the URI, but I may want to pass things the similar things in uh, the values. So I can say name equals value and bar equals value. And so now I'm making a request to, to slash foo. Again, like I said, the content length of 20. Ah, why doesn't it show me? I don't know why it's not showing me the body. Anyways, uh, so it will set the content like 20 to say there's 20 characters, and then a new line, and then sends these 20 bytes, which should be this value. Is this 20? I don't want to count it, but... Uh, Yeah, 20, good. Way easier than counting. So it sends that there as the body. So that would be how you can pass data as a post as part of the HTTP body. Uh, so it shows you the different ways that you can pass parameters in that way. And I think that that's all you need. So good luck.